this morning. We are in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And if you'll stand with me, I'd like to read a few verses to you and we'll go right into the study. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 3. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain from which and from such withdraw yourself. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Lord, as uh, these verses strike a chord with some of us, we pray that you'll help us to understand what they actually mean to us today. As uh, these were placed in this location for our benefit, and as we've been learning about how the church is to behave, this is certainly good advice for us now. So speak to our hearts. We've all come here expecting to hear from you, and we, we have open ears now. So give us, uh, give us everything that we need to know. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This last week I had a conversation with a brother uh, in my office. It was a brother that didn't come to our church, but he found himself in a bit of need and wanted to talk to a pastor. And so he stopped in, and I was able to talk with him a bit. As we were carrying on our conversation, we wound up discussing the different doctrines that people believe in and the need for, for biblical truth in the teaching of those doctrines and in our acceptance or rece receiving of them. Uh, in our conversation, I was a bit surprised when he asked, there are so many different opinions out there. How do you know who's telling the truth? And... Uh, uh, also, in the same line, he said, don't all churches claim to teach from the Bible? And uh, I, I was shocked at his uh, discernment, or perhaps lack thereof. Uh, doctrinal discernment has always been a challenge for Christians, and not all believers are able to judge accurately or correctly. We tend to really focus on something we don't need to focus on or will accept something that we shouldn't be accepting. And so uh, we want to be careful. But the truth is that not all Bible-believing churches believe the same things about the Bible. Uh, for instance, some believe in the rapture of the church, but some don't. Some believe that you're saved by good works, and some don't. Some believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are in operation for today. Some don't. Some believe in the security of a believer. Some don't. Some believe that Christians can be demon-possessed. Some don't. Some believe that God wants you healthy and wealthy. Some don't. Christians really need to be more familiarized with such teachings and especially so that they can become more discerning regarding such matters. Yet, with so many variations of Bible teachings and teachers, how do we know who's right? Well, I think here in our text, the Apostle Paul gives us a bit of a test, something that will help us to determine what is, in fact, true teaching. I call this the test of true teaching. Now, there are three steps to this test. It's really a series of three questions that we can ask in order to, de to determine if someone is teaching a true doctrine or if it is a doctrine worth keeping in our arsenal, if you will, or as part of our biblical foundation. We want to know, is it a biblical doctrine or is it just the opinion of man? Now, keep in mind that, that everyone who teaches the Bible should not be teaching the Bible. Not everyone is a teacher. Teaching is a gift of the Holy Spirit, and, and not every saint is going to possess the same gifts of the Spirit. Now, I wish that we could all be teachers, but that's really not the case at all. We, we can all, however, be students and true disciples and followers of Jesus Christ, and as such, we can all stand in biblical truth 
if we will learn biblical truth. And that is the point. The point is to be able to stand in truth, but in order to stand in truth, we have to know what truth is, and in order to know what truth is, we need to ask the right questions. And so the first question to ask is, does this teaching contradict or confirm the New Testament? Does the teaching in question contradict or confirm the New Testament? Paul says this in our text in verse 3, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. So Paul is here saying, if anyone teaches otherwise, Otherwise, or another doctrine, in the Greek the word is heterodidaskaleo, heterodidaskaleo, and it means other teachings. Uh, now, as we look at this in our context, in other words, with verse 2, we can read where Paul, at the end of verse 2, says, teach and exhort these things. If anyone teaches other things, otherwise, that's hetero didaskaleo. Didaskaleo meaning teachings or doctrines, hetero meaning other or different, another. Now from these words of Paul here in, this, in, this, uh, in, in verses 2 and 3, we understand that there must have been an approved set of teachings or an accepted doctrine, accepted as true doctrine, true Christian doctrine of our faith. Today, we refer to that accepted group of teachings as orthodoxy, orthodox teaching, meaning it is teaching which is standard to the Christian faith. It has been established or approved over the centuries as doctrines that we accept, orthodox teaching. Doctrine which is unapproved teaching would therefore be called heterodoxy or heterodox teaching, meaning that it's others' teaching. It's something completely different. It's, it's not the standard. It's not the norm. So heter heterodox is unorthodox teaching, meaning that it's anything which deviates from the apostolic doctrine, the apostles' doctrine. You remember in Acts chapter 2, when we read that the church continued in the apostles' doctrine, to go outside of the apostles' doctrine would be heterodoxy, heterodoxy, another teaching. Now, the point here is if the apostles didn't teach it, then we shouldn't be eating it either. If they're not feeding it, why are we eating it? That's, that's a good way of, of looking at this. We shouldn't be taking in something that the apostles just didn't teach or write about. So here Paul says, teach and exhort these things. If anyone teaches otherwise, and Paul definitely has these approved doctrines in view throughout this entire chapter. He referred to it as doctrine or to teaching a couple of different times in verses 1 and verse 3. He called it the truth in verse 5. He referred to it as the faith in verses 10, 12, and 21. He called it a commandment in verse 14, and he called it something that was committed into his trust in verse 20. Very important. So Paul's exhortation here is that we take our doctrines very seriously, even guarding them with our own personal lives. Doctrine is something worth fighting for, or we'll soon lose it in the battle for Christianity altogether as a result. And so it's very important. Now this first word that I've drawn your attention to was heterodidaskaleo. The next word is also an interesting word, pros erkomai. Pros erkomai, it means literally to draw near or to hold the line. We would, we would say, let's rally behind it. Let's remain loyal to it, faithful to it. Verse 3 reads this way, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not hold the line does not consent to it. He doesn't accept it, really meaning he doesn't agree with it, nor does he have a deep conviction of it being true. Now, you consider this whole verse in full context. If anyone teaches otherwise, does not consent to wholesome words, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. Two reasons why we need to rally around the doctrine that the Apostle Paul is talking about here. First of all, this is the doctrine of Jesus Christ. His doctrine is the word of Jesus himself. He, Jesus says as much to his disciples in Luke chapter 10 and verse 16. He said, anyone who accepts your message is also accepting me. And anyone who rejects you is rejecting me. Anyone who rejects me is rejecting God who sent me. So Paul's doctrine is our Lord's doctrine. Even though Paul wrote it, it was the Holy Spirit who inspired him to write it and told him what to write. And so here we have the inspiration of Scripture, the doctrine of the inspiration of Scripture, where this is Jesus' teachings. Paul teaches it, but it's the teaching of Jesus. Now the second reason we should stand behind Paul's doctrine is because it's good doctrine. Not only is it good doctrine, but it's healthy doctrine in that it promotes godliness. It says it's a doctrine which accords with godliness, or as the New Living Translation has those words, these teachings promote a godly life, a godly lifestyle. And the doctrines of the New Testament are good doctrines. They're healthy doctrines. They're doctrines that we need in our Christian life. In fact, Paul called them wholesome words. The Greek word for wholesome is hugiaino. Hugiaino is where we get the English word hygiene. It's talking about hygiene or, or understanding it to mean good health. And so God has prescribed for us good, a good and healthy diet uh, from his word so that Christians can grow and mature by feeding upon the word of God. Any doctrine from Christ will always lead us to godliness, will always lead us to betterment or to a good life. To deviate from the doctrine of Christ or from good teaching, true teaching, to substitute it, to tamper with it, is not healthy, nor is it wise. Therefore, the first test of true teaching is this. Does this teaching in question contradict or confirm the New Testament. And anything, of course, that can contradicts the New Testament needs to be abandoned and rejected immediately because it will become detrimental to your spiritual health. The second question we must ask, does this teaching in question divide or unite the, the church? Does the teaching in question divide or unite the church. In verse 4, in the middle of verse 5, Paul says he is proud, the one who teaches other doctrines. He is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men, of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth. It's sort of a thing of logic. In other words, if, if healthy doctrine will lead us to godliness. Well, then we expect that as people are growing in godliness within a local assembly of believers, that church would experience unity. It, it seems logical. If unhealthy doctrine is taught and tolerated within a, a local body of believers, the sheep will remain immature and unhealthy and that will ultimately lead to problems, to bickerings, to fightings among each other, and that will create division and disunity. That seems logical. True teaching will always bring about or inspire or encourage love and good works. Whereas false teaching will feed the flesh, will feed your flesh and lead people to continue in the bad works of the old life. Here's how Paul puts it again. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, this is what he is. And he, he lists a bunch of them. In fact, he compiles a list, uh, a couple of lists for us, which seem to, to define the fruit of false teaching or what will happen if we are not careful of the things that we eat, spiritually speaking. Now, this is a bit of a hard exhortation but a very necessary one, something that if we apply it will help us to judge our own lives. Very important that we judge our own lives. 
We judge our own ministries and even the church that we attend against this list if we're brave enough. And that's, that's the point. And uh, we, we need to be willing to kind of put ourselves out there and, and be examined by the Word of God. Now, where false teaching is present, well, then these things will persist and dominate. And, and I've compiled them sort of into three words, three words that I want to give to you. The first is arrogance. Arrogance. Paul said simply, he is proud. Arrogance speaks of boastful superiority and conceit. True teaching, when it's taught in its entirety, the, the full counsel of God, should put man in a proper light in his relationship or in comparison to the Almighty God. When we see ourselves in the right light, in the true light, it should humble us. It should bring us toward humility. False teaching, on the, on the other hand, lies about man's condition. False teaching notoriously promotes and exalts self or ego. And that will only produce the negative fruits of arrogance and pride. Paul said in Romans 12, 3, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. So arrogance, pride must go. It's something that we all must fight against in our personal lives, and true teaching will help us to do that. False teaching will foster it or make your pride even stronger. The second word is ignorance. Paul said, knowing nothing. This man knows nothing, meaning he lacks understanding of truth. Well, of course he would. When we have a wrong view of ourselves, we have a wrong view of man, especially in relation to God, then everything is going to be wrong. Everything will be off. Solomon makes that very clear in the Proverbs when he said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy brings understanding. So the Lord's knowledge or the knowledge that comes from God, the word of God, will bring proper understanding and bring even our relationship to God to light. The psalmist saying the same thing in Psalm 111, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. Now, that's an interesting thing. As the world keeps kicking out the commandments of God, what are we lacking in our world? Wisdom, understanding. Those are the things that we're lacking because we reject truth. The third word I want to give to you is belligerence. Belligerence. Arrogance, ignorance, belligerence. Paul said, he is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words. Argumentative, aggressive, and difficult. That's what we're talking about here. I'm sure you've run into someone in that condition. But we're not talking about the average belligerent person. This is not one of the normal variety. This type of belligerent person always likes to argue obscure Bible passages or difficult and veiled prophetic verses, things that are deep, things that most people struggle with and find it difficult to understand, and he likes to share from his version of things or his interpretation of things. Why? Who can argue with him? The verses are so obscure. Who knows what they mean? Most of us kind of scratch our head and go, yeah, I don't really know what it is. Oh, come to me. I've got all the answers for those verses. That, of course, not only is belligerent, it's a bit arrogant. But certain people who don't understand the simple teachings of the simple Christian life always seem to want to delve into these deeper things that nobody gives a rip about, if you know what I'm saying. Prophetic verses that are iffy at best. And so we look at them and we... we, we these types of folks, I don't know if you've ever had the pleasure, but they like to tie you up for hours in conversation about the tiniest insignificant details and go on and on and on about how much they think they know. 
And it might impress some. It just bugs the heck out of me. But from this list, arrogance, ignorance, and belligerence, Paul seems to bring a second list out of that. In other words, those who are arrogant, ignorant, and belligerent bear the fruit of this second list. The first on the list is envy. Envy is not like jealousy. It's a bit like jealousy, but it's not jealousy. Jealousy just wants to have what someone else has. I drive down the road. I see a bulldozer for sale. I hit my wife and I say, I want that. That's, I, I wish I had it, okay? That may not necessarily be jealous. She goes, what are you going to do with a bulldozer? I said, I don't have one. So she, <laughs> there's a lot of things, you know, backhoe, whatever, whatever may be for sale. There's the things I just, you know, it's a guy thing. I like those things. Don't, am I the only one that thinks that way? Or do you guys like bulldozers and big things? I just want them. I like them. I don't even have a farm. I just want them. <laughs> Envy is even more destructive than that. Envy wants to take away what that person has to keep it for yourself so that the other person doesn't have it. Envy can turn ugly, and many sins actually are traced back to this root sin of envy. Now, it might have uh, been the sin that was involved at the heart of the Bible's first recorded murder, When Cain slew his brother Abel, envy. Envy is an ugly sin. The second word on Paul's second list is strife. Striving is the spirit of competition, which can also be a fruit of envy. Now, competition in its its right form is not an evil thing. It's it's good. I think it's always good uh, to have a, a good, healthy Uh, competition, especially in sports. It would be terrible to have sports if there was no such thing as competition. In fact, it would be boring. You may as well needle needle point. It's not something that we get into very well. But it can become a sin. This is the competition that is always striving among people to kind of be one up on someone else. It's the sin that drives the Joneses, you know, the Joneses, you know, the, or the, the, uh, the opponents of the Joneses. The Joneses always have more. The grass is always greener. I want green grass like that. And so they strive to, to be better than the next person simply to, uh, to say they have the better thing. And but this is not something that we want to be involved with. This sort of striving leaves you unhappy because you're always wanting more. Even if you get more, you still want even more. Striving is the result of a dissatisfied soul, a dissatisfied heart. It's that sense within you that you must always be on top and that you must always do something to obtain something, but you're not sure what that something is that you're supposed to obtain. And you keep striving for it. And you think that you have it. But even if you get it, it doesn't seem to scratch the itch. And so the search continues and the result is strife and discontentment in your life. Strife is an unsettling sin. The third word on Paul's second list is reviling. The Greek word for reviling is our English word blasphemy and means to slander or to insult. To revile most commonly means to speak negatively against someone else. In this particular context, it can also mean to speak negatively about other ministries or other ministers because, after all, the only way to look good is to make someone else look bad. And that makes you look good against that someone else who is bad. And so you start talking that person down and suddenly you look a lot better than they do. Uh, well, that's probably what we're talking about here, which of course is also seems to be the root of envy. Now, to revile can also take a form against God when we shake a defiant fist against the Lord. This is to revile God or to blaspheme God. And this sort of defiance is really rooted in one's arrogance, ignorance, and belligerence, if you can imagine that. The fourth word on Paul's second list is 
suspicions or evil suspicions, and it simply means quick to judge. That probably doesn't apply to many of us in this room at all. Most of us are probably not quick to judge. We're not quick to jump to conclusions without any information at all about the matter. But that's really what it's talking about, and it refers to a judgmental nature. You criticize, you judge everything and everyone because your opinion is the better opinion of all. That the Bible calls evil suspicion, evil judgments. And unfortunately, we do that quite regularly, and it often gets us in great trouble. And it's a terrible mistake to make because a lot of unnecessary damage is done to innocent people when we misjudge or judge too quickly. Now, as I'm going through these words and all the different things, I'm sure the list sounds, well, a bit familiar. And if it does sound familiar to you, it it should, because it's part of another list that the Apostle Paul entitled, The Works of the Flesh. They're the works of the flesh. In Galatians 5, Paul said, The works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So Paul, trying to scare us, gives us a more extensive list, similar to what we've been talking about. Those words that we covered this morning are certainly on Paul's list in Galatians chapter 5. But it's even more familiar to us than that because, well, that sounds like our old life. Our old lives, before we came to Christ, were all about those types of sins. The striving, the envy, the the driving of self, the arrogance, the, the ignorance, the belligerence, that was probably a good part of many of our lives. The point that Paul is is getting at here is that false teaching feeds that old life. False teaching makes it okay to stay that way. And that's not the characteristic of true teaching. True teaching teaching that is contained within the boundaries of the apostles' doctrines, will always mature the believer and empower you to move away from the old life, to turn away from those old sins, that that the old ways of thinking that, that told us it was okay to behave that way. Now, with true teaching, true teaching says, no, 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 Christian. It's not okay to behave that way anymore. That's what you used to be like. That's not you anymore. Now it's time to grow up. Now it's time to change. Paul said, when I was a child, I did childish things, but now that I'm a man and mature, I have to put away those childish things, and I have to start living for Christ. That's the idea of true teaching, and that's what we must have in our lives. But but if we should avoid or abandon true teaching, well, then we'll stay the same. We'll not grow. True teaching will always mature you bring you closer to God. Paul categorized these other doctrines, these heterodoxy, as the useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, meaning they're empty-headed, immoral men who don't have a clue what they're talking about. That's what he's, that's what he's basically saying. These doctrines, these other doctrines, are and the men who spread them, will never unite the Christian church, but these will continue to spread division throughout the Christian body of Christ. Division will always occur when we reject the truth of Jesus Christ and begin to live for our flesh. Always. You know, it's interesting on a side note, it's funny how that, this word heresy, we've heard it before. We use the word heresy and we often refer to false teaching. 
But the meaning of the word literally means the act of choosing. The act of choosing. Isn't that interesting? If we allow heresy to saturate the church family, it soon will force people to make a choice, to choose a side. And that's what division looks like. Now the third question that we must ask ourselves: does this teaching in question promote covetousness or contentment? Does the teaching promote covetousness or contentment? In the middle of verse 5, Paul said that these guys suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, I already mentioned that true teaching should always lead you to godliness and closer to God. It should lead you to a deeper knowledge of God, a greater desire to know God. It should want you to, it should cause you to want to be holy because your Father in heaven is holy. But false teaching, or rather the false teachers, always have a way historically to exploit religion and exploit your religion. They, they see religion as a means for material gain or to achieve material blessings, is the terminology. Now we've had many versions of this erroneous approach or this erroneous teaching through the years. One of the more recent ones, the more popular ones, we call today the word faith doctrine. Perhaps you're familiar with it. Perhaps you've heard of it. This is a teaching which proposes that God wants all Christians to be healthy and wealthy. And if you'll but speak a positive word in faith, then God will grant you whatever you desire. It goes by another name. We've called it the name it and claim it doctrine. They claim that your positive confession will bring healing into your life, perhaps prosperity in material or financial ways. Their ultimate belief is that God wants you rich. That's what they believe. Now, obviously, this is heterodoxy. This is another form of teaching. It's not truth. It's heresy. And the reason we say that is because there's no truth or biblical basis for such claims. This doesn't come from the Bible. Oh, it comes from twisting Bible verses. It comes from massaging or manipulating certain Bible verses. But it doesn't come from the, the simple teaching of the Word of God. This does come from a heart or from a motive that is not about contentment and holiness at all, but rather greed. This is a motive of greed. It's a way to wrap this false spiritual language around the, the cravings of the flesh, which are selfish, and to promote a false promise of material gain. Or as Paul put it, they suppose that godliness is a means of gain. And they claim to you that if you're a godly person, if you're exceptionally spiritual, then you should be rich. If you're not rich, well then obviously you lack the faith or the spirituality. Now the next time you hear someone say something like that, punch them in the nose. <laughs> Tell them it's, it's, it's just silly, silly, silly teaching. It's ridiculous. Of course, these doctrines and these motives are wrong. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. It's better to be a generous person than a greedy person. That's the Christian way. Now, these types of doctrines and these movements and men like them, women like them, really have it wrong. Paul said, from such, withdraw yourself. Stay away from them. Don't attach yourself to them. Don't affiliate with them. Don't watch their TV programs and don't buy their books. That's what he's saying. Don't, don't give them any 
attention at all. Save your money. Don't hang out with people who think that way, because if you do, soon you will think that way. Soon you'll be moved and motivated by greed rather than the spirit of Christ, which is generosity. That's the spirit of Jesus. Paul said, godliness with contentment is wealth. That's your gain. That's great gain. That's the biblical teaching. That's biblical truth. And that is the road to genuine peace. Now, contentment here speaks of peace, but it speaks of a satisfaction of the things of life. You're satisfied. I have Christ, and that's enough for me. But the unsatisfied life says, Jesus is all I get. That's all. Where's my Mercedes? Where's my mansion with 72 toilets? I want, I want wealth. I want prosperity. I want, I want health. I want to live forever. Jesus said, you fool, this day your soul will be required of you. Where is your soul? Where is your heart? We start putting our attention on the finances, the, the, the wealth and the materialism. We are all out of shape. Now, this poor fellow came into my office. He was a very nice man. He was a good Christian man, I thought. He had a, he had a heart in the right place. I think he, he wanted to be a godly man. In fact, he was in tears, thinking that he wasn't godly enough. It was breaking his heart. But his real struggle wasn't with his desire for godliness. It was, it was with contentment. He wasn't content with being a godly person. He wanted something more. And I think that contentment comes from believing what the Bible promises us and not in pursuing after material things. Peter said that we have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. John said this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. Jude said that Jesus will keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. Isn't that a precious promise? The Apostle Paul said, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And later on in that same chapter of Romans 8, he said, and we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now listen, these are actual New Testament promises. These are verses that belong to you, and each one of them is a stone so that you can build a solid foundation for your life. Every one of them. But the, the secret of it is that you have to believe it. It's not enough to just memorize them. It's not enough to post them on your refrigerator. You have to appropriate them. You have to say, not only do I know that verse in my head, I believe it is mine. That's how I will live my life. And if you don't live your life that way, then you're building your life on sand. You've got the Bible. You know it inside and out. But your life is built on sand. And the fairy tales that people wrap around the Bible, they're not true doctrines. They're false doctrines. They're cotton candy. And they cannot provide a healthy life for you. And when the storms come, and the winds blow, and the rains, floodwaters rise, you have no foundation to withstand it. And that's why this poor fellow was in my office in tears, because he wasn't even sure that he was a Christian. He had absolutely no security of his faith in Jesus Christ when the Bible guarantees it. He didn't believe it. He had no assurance of his salvation, no no assurance of heaven. He had no assurance of the presence of God upon his life. That's because he had built his life upon sand with fairy tale doctrines and no solid foundation could be found in this shaky man's life. And I, I have to say, I met him that day for the first time, and I scolded him. I said, what have you been doing with your life? What are you building your life upon? Do you believe these things or not? Well, yeah, well, yeah I, I, I believe. Oh, then, then take hold of them, man. Start thinking correctly. 
He was moved by his feelings, not by what he knew from Scripture. And that's, the, that's really the, the, the gymnastics of the mind that the Christian has to go through every day, every day. Because lies are being fed to us every day. And we have to meet that lie with the Word of God and stop it dead in its tracks. If it's not truth, then you may as well throw a water balloon at it because it can't do a thing. You have to meet it with the truth of God's Word, not the fallacies or the fairy tales that someone else taught you as an opinion of what they think the truth is. It's a whole different ball of wax. So you have to make sure. Here are the three simple questions that we ask. And when you ask them together, they serve as the test of true teaching. And the first is, does it contradict or confirm the New Testament? Well, true teaching would would never contradict, but always confirm what the New Testament tells us. Does it divide or unite the church? Does it cause you to be set apart as if you think you're better than everyone else? Uh, That's a wrong way of thinking. Because true teaching will unite the body of Christ. Does it promote covetousness or teach you to be content with Jesus? And the satisfaction of knowing that, that you, a wretched sinner, once was lost is now found through the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. And if that is not where you find yourself today, then you've got some homework to do. You've got to start doing this test with every doctrine that you think is truth. Because these are important for every Christian. But there's even, uh, uh, these, are, this, it's, these are important questions for every Christian. But there's even a greater question to ask in this moment, a bigger question. And that is, do you know where you'll be should you die today? You may not believe in an afterlife, but that really doesn't matter whether you believe in it or not. Because there is an afterlife. And if you were to die, do you know where you will be? And if you say, well, yes, I know. How do you know? Where is the assurance of what you know? I have it. I I know where I'm going to be, and I know why I'm going to be there. If you want to be a solid Christian, standing on solid ground, then you've got to find this Bible, find out what it means, and why it is you believe what you believe. But if you don't know where you're going to be today, the Bible gives you only two possibilities. Either heaven or hell. However, we are given an option. Because when you think about it, hell already belongs to us. It's already ours. Every sinner who dies without believing in Jesus Christ already has hell. It's not like you're up in the air right now. No, no. You are already in hell. And here's what Jesus says about that. He said, Whoever believes in him, meaning Jesus, is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the, in the name of the only Son of God. In other words, you're already going to hell because of your sins. But you have an option. You can believe in Jesus Christ. And it changes everything. It changes your life. It changes your destiny. You can go to heaven. It's as simple as that. And you know why I say that? You know how I can promise you that? Because the Bible promises us that. It's not my promise. It's not Frank's invention. This is the promise of God from the Bible. Today we offer you the opportunity to change your life and your destiny by putting your faith in Jesus Christ and mean it. If you mean it, you can be saved. Let's pray. Lord, as we put our Our minds on you in this moment, our thoughts are constantly being challenged by truth. That is the spiritual fight. That is the spiritual battle. 
truth versus lie. And I pray that today we would come face to face with the truth. And the truth is that you came to die for sinners, to set us free from sin and the fear of eternal damnation. We're free now by believing in Jesus Christ. And if you haven't settled that issue yet, then today I give you the opportunity to do so. Where you're seated right now and in your heart, just simply ask the Lord to save you. Lord, forgive me of my sins. That's what you tell them. Forgive me of what I've done and all that I I am. I've I've been such a, a wrong person and a bad person. And I'm asking you to help me. Save me. Change me. Give me eternal life. And do that through my belief, my faith in Jesus Christ. In your precious name I pray. Amen.